Chapter 4 Eliminating Unsafed Acts Our objectives Explain empowerment and how it relates to the fire ground. Define what constitutes an unsafe act. List some examples of energy conversion and how they can cause injuries. List some of the perceived problems with using PPE. List examples for each of the four categories of unsafe acts. List examples of using education, engineering, environment, and enforcement to prevent injuries. Describe the difference between training fires and real fires and why it is important to understand them. Describe ways to address a safety concern with your supervisor. Describe crew resource management and its application to a fire ground situation. Explain the difference between, quote, bolt-on safety and built-in safety. List the four components of human interaction necessary to institute crew resource management. Tradition has been the backbone of the operations of the fire service forever and today. We were, we're very steeped in tradition, and this can be good and bad. Now, early on in our career, we are exposed to this no fear attitude or reasoning. And it's important to note that some incidences exceed the capabilities of first arriving units. But safe actions build the foundation for effective actions and a positive incident outcome. Some aspects of our tradition tend to build on the foundation of unsafe practices, such as in that earlier incident saying, okay, um, we have no fear, we're really overwhelmed, this is more fire than we can handle, let's you know, run in and, and, and do what we can and begin to put the fire out before the next arriving units get on scene. Now, is that something that is safe? Would it be better served if maybe they started doing, say, a defensive attack or an exterior attack initially, begin darkening down the fire, and then once additional resources show up to put maybe like, you know, the RIT team in place or more members of the crew, and then if the situation dictates, go ahead and do an interior attack. So this was kind of some food for thought for this chapter. So where does this unsafe practice foundation come from? And it's important to know, if we know where it comes from, then maybe we can go ahead and begin to addressing it now so we can prevent this from happening in the future. So when we're looking at our new firefighter trainees, they are given a sense of security and, of course, you know, taught not to fear. You know, your gear will protect you. We throw them in a training burn uh, where we don't have all the unknowns and the higher burn limits of the plastics and synthetics, you know. But they are trained to take orders from the first day at the academy. They learn to trust their officer's judgment and follow his or her lead. They have the latest protective gear, if you're lucky. Hopefully it's not the hand-me-down stuff. And they are taught what they have perceived as fear is both normal and exciting. We push them through dangerous scenarios over and over again, and they emerge unscathed. So the new firefighters pick up these unsafe habits from the veteran firefighters and the habits that the veterans learned on the job. So this is a recipe for these new rookies to get themselves in trouble. Some things that they don't really understand is most of their training is not realistic 
and, and hear me out on this before you start, you know, chiming up and going crazy. But when we do our live burns, they must adhere to NFPA 1403, which, you know, provides the procedures and buildings and personal preparation and limits the use of Class A materials in the burn building. The increase in the fuel load, the way the fire reacts, and the rate at which the fire releases heat is different from the real world. Now, because of that, flashover can occur twice as quickly in the real world. Flooring materials and furnishing are made of different materials than that just plain old wood that they're being trained with, that ordinary Class A stuff. Often in times, they have larger crews. You know, the, the four-man crews go in where uh, most departments you have three or maybe two or even one, depending. When they're doing these training burns, There are all kind of checks and safety precautions that are in place, and I think they're good, don't get me wrong, but the personnel are required to walk through the building and all the hazards are identified and exits are identified prior to setting the fire. Is this safe? Yes. Is this appropriate? Yes. Does this happen in the real world? No. It does not. You know, maybe you do have some walkthrough if you're doing a pre-plan, but more times than not, you know, you look at your, you know, Type 5 residential structure, and no, you don't have a, a walkthrough on it, and you don't know what's there. So, when you're teaching these students, it's great to be safe and make them feel comfortable wearing the gear and, and start developing that mental Rolodex and, and how to fight fire and what to do. So once they do get to the live fire, you know, they have some knowledge base to draw on. But we need to stress to the students while they're training that this is not the real world. And once you get to the real world, you need to expect the unexpected and know that these fires are uncontrolled environment. Now, as you see by all these extra little assignments that I have you do that kind of go through the life safety initiatives, um, we're going to talk about them and how they need to be incorporated into a safety type culture. Now one of those initiatives is initiative four which declares that all employees should be empowered to stop unsafe acts. But the word empower is sometimes confusing and often misunderstood or misused. So let's make sure we clarify that. Empowerment is defined as granting permission to subordinates to exceed their normal authority to better achieve organizational goals. Now there are a couple of problems with implementing this textbook definition in the emergency services. There has to be a clear line between what is permitted and what is not. Although you may be empowered to solve a specific problem, you may not know how to do it safely or have the equipment to do it properly. In his book, Creating an open book organization, Thomas McCoy provided three components to empowerment. And those three components are education, enablement, and empowerment. First, 
education. The first component is to educate all personnel on the issue. Provide knowledge about all aspects to the issue is vital to success. Risk benefit analysis model will be used to ensure structural consideration where second only to safety concern. And remember that's, you know, what we think about that in terms of Brunacini is, you know, risk a lot to save a lot, risk a little to save a little, risk nothing to save what is already lost. Proper education would teach triage situations about when to assess and when not to. Misinformation and damage control would be part of this educational process. Now enablement. Enable employees to provide the desired service. Now equipment may be available for use or loan. So when we're talking about enabling, get them what they need to do the job. General policies may be used to enable crews to use equipment appropriately. And of course, forms could be created to be used in certain situations. So, you know, educate your folks, enable them to do the job, give them the tools to do the job. And then once your personnel are trained and equipped, you then empower them to do the job. Okay, let's talk briefly about accidents. Accidents is one of the most misused term in the fire and emergency services. Accident is sometimes defined as an occurrence with tragic results that could not be predicted or prevent it. If something is predictable and preventable, it is unintentional, i.e. not an accident. Firefighter injury epidemiology can be described as the study of the causes of injury and the interventions applied to reduce those injuries to firefighters. Now the law of conservation of energy states that energy is constant and then it can neither be created nor destroyed, only change form. Now, energy can be transferred and present itself as either kinetic energy or potential energy. Kinetic energy is basically movement or at work. Potential energy is at rest. Significant energy conversion occurs at an emergency scene. Every time energy is transferred, the change of energy to a firefighter is present. Now again, let's make sure we understand. Kinetic energy is basically movement type energy or changing form. Potential energy is energy at rest. So that book sitting on your table right now is potential energy. You slide that book off the table, now it turns into kinetic energy because now it's moving, it's at work. Now two separate defenses we can employ to either defer an energy or reduce its severity, and that is safety equipment and operational redundancy. First, safety equipment. PPE perceptions. People 
perceiving things differently. Example, explosion and fire on the, the deep water horizon well ahead in Gulf of Mexico is a good example of that. Uh, but we need to realize that when a new piece of safety equipment is introduced, it probably has some sort of merit to it. But what we don't understand a lot of times is PPE has limitations. It is only effective when used properly. Now, operational redundancies. Psychologist James Reason compared an accident chain to Swiss cheese. And what we mean by accident change is that series of events that have to occur in order for this disaster or accident to happen. Now, with the Swiss cheese theory, each slice has holes or potential flaws that alone cause no problem. However, once those holes begin to line up, then it allows stuff to pass through, i.e., you know, the accident. So we have all these different components, and if they line up just right, there's a hole going all the way through it, and somebody gets hurt. Now, several fail-safe measures can be combined to prevent these accidents so those holes don't line up. One example is the Piper Alpha disaster, which heavily influenced safety practices and systems. And that goes a little more detailed in the text. It is important to initially identify an unsafe act that starts that cascading series of events that causes an accident. Now, unsafe acts are categorized in four different types, and we'll go into these in a second. First, visible. Two, invisible. Third, poor decisions. And fourth, distracting events. Now, these types often overlap and can include underlying or contributing factors that heighten the chance of injury. So looking at our first type, visible, which is basically an unsafe act is spotted. Unsafe practices are taught in basic training. Unfortunately, now firefighters can improve on safety infractions through the use of what is known as no fault management. No fault management is based on a theory that considers that employee a professional who has a desire to mitigate someone else's bad situation. A person who pretends to have noble intentions, but who is willing to compromise safety uh, is a poser and it doesn't apply. But with the no fault management, basically it's saying that, hey, anyone can speak up and say that, you know, this is a mistake without fear of reprisal. You know, the main goal here is fixing the unsafe behavior so an accident doesn't occur. So you're not worried about, oh, getting in trouble or getting reprimanded. Our next type is that unsafe act is disguised or invisible. Besides the obvious unsafe acts, Sometimes there are many hidden dangers, and these can be seen in near misses. And if you haven't gone to the near miss report, that is a great resource that um, 
helps identify that, hey, you know what, uh, th this was a close call. We can learn from it because, hey, we didn't know it, and, you know, let's get it out there. So initiative number nine deals with the problems of your near misses and ways to incorporate them into a form format that would create an awareness for the potential problem. So when you have these invisible or these um, disguised unsafe acts and you come up with them, hey, let other people know. So now that it can be used as a learning tool and make them visible to other individuals. Next, we have poor risk management decision. And again, that's risk a little, save a little. We do not follow this rule very well a lot of times. Um, all firefighters need to understand risk management and recognition when an unsafe practice is occurring. So on scene, our strategic choices are offensive, defensive, or marginal. Sometimes backing off is your best choice to reevaluate the condition. Burdened at the time of incident, a person already has a perceived disadvantage. The only thing missing from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health report is the underlying psychological factors that affect the decisions that were made. So with our poor decisions, you know, think about it. Don't, don't just rush in. Um, take a minute. And I know that we are in a very fast pace and we're all very type A and we want to help and we want to do, but you know, sometimes we gotta treat it like a hazmat scene, take a step back, make sure what we're dealing with, come up with a plan, then initiate the plan. Lastly, we had the distracting events. So unsafe practices that are usually pretty obvious to everyone else, but you just don't notice them. You know, you got that tunnel vision. You you're focusing on A, and while you're doing that, somebody does something stupid on, you know, B and C, so to speak. The best time to catch an unsafe tax is before it happens. And the President Conference on Fire Prevention established an action program in 1947 to combat fire. President Truman identified the three E's of prevention. And this kind of goes toward Initiative 14, and that's education, engineering, Initiative 8, and enforcement, which is in Initiative 9-11. Sometimes the fourth E is in environmental or Initiative 1. Environment means altering actions based on choice rather than on need. The ability to identify unsafe acts is vital. Then firefighters have to be empowered to report it. Most importantly, firefighters must know how to bring up this concern. Now, there are Three ways to bring up this concern to your supervisor or somebody uh, higher up. And you want to do it respectfully. So you want to plan for the problem, request to complete a task, or call a timeout are, are three ways. And we'll go through each one of these. First, plan for the problem. And this pursues ways to eliminate the problem in the future. Uh, you know, earplugs, whatever the case may be. And this speaks directly to your peers. Without the captain present, start with a surprise expression and then offer them a way out. Many times, talking with your coworkers is better than going to the supervisor. 
speak directly to your supervisor. When you talk to your supervisor, remember that power is in play. So be polite. Do not question their authority or power. All right, the next one was politely request to complete a task. An incident is not the time for discussion about safety procedures or refusing orders. We, we all understand that. But by offering to get something yourself, you make it clear that you are not questioning authority or trying to get out of work. You simply do not have the equipment that you need. Or maybe, you know, you want to eliminate something that is unsafe first. If the situation permits, call a timeout. It's very effective when hand singles are the best form of communication. It uses common communication to say that, hey, it's time to reevaluate what we're doing. Now, working with unsafe acts, sometimes an unsafe act is recognized but simply cannot be avoided. You know, examples being um, combating wind-driven fires or uh, some, you know, environmental thing that you have no control over. Now, the potential for working with an unsafe deck should be identified and planned for whenever possible. One of the most important aspects is post-incident critique or debriefing. Post-incident critique, or PIC, is one of the most important functions to perform when the emergency is over. Also called post-incident debriefing or post-incident evaluation or after-action review AAR. These critiques are used primarily to discuss tactical effectiveness. If safe concerns arose, this is the form to talk about managing, changing, or purchasing equipment to prevent it from happening again. It is important to note that in these critiques, you don't want to assign blame because then you know, it gets turned into one of those blame games. Oh, well, you know, uh, company four, it's their fault. Well, then company four goes, well, if you would have got water, blah, blah, blah. And then it's a series of cascading events, okay? Identify what went right, what went wrong. Is there any safety issues? And what we can do to improve or prevent it from happening in the future. Identifying and having resources to combat unsafe practices puts you in the position of being empowered to stop one. CRM, or Crew Resource Management, was adopted by the aviation industry in response to senseless crashes. This system allows and encourages members of a flight crew to make observations and suggestions when a perceived danger is present. Now, it started as what's known as a bolt-on component, but was reviewed and adjusted until it was finally interwoven through training modules. So, you know, bolt-on means basically you have a policy in place already, and then you're just going to, you know, bolt this on or add it to it. And eventually, over time, it was built into the program. Not popular until the first air disaster was averted and the captain identified CRM as the reason they survived. So once it showed that it worked, hey, you know what? This is a pretty good idea with this crew resource management because who better 
to identify safety issues, then the people that deal with it or work with it every day. Now, we have already discussed how much influences human decisions and mistakes have on safety. And crew resource management addresses ways to minimize these unsafe practices. Now, there are four different components of human interaction that are applicable to the fire and emergency services. First being policies and procedures. Second, situational awareness. Third, communication. And fourth, problem solving. The first component of crew resource management applicable to the emergency service is SOPs and SOGs. So standing operating procedures or guidelines that need to be looked at are those relating to authority. The fire service has adopted its own checklist, usually in the forms of tactical worksheets and accountability logs. Uh, you know, in terms of A, B, C, and D, this is what you do on a fire. With the National Incident Management System, NFPA, and OSHA pulling different terminology and operations together, a more national standardized checklist should be developed. Training is the last policy that must be checked or with regards to training in terms of critical resource management practices. Situational awareness is another important component of implementation for crew resource management. There are two significant aspects of situational awareness and that is task, saturation, and mistakes. First being task saturations, and errors occur during task saturation portions of an emergency. Line-oriented fire training is an excellent way to role play the observation and decisions that must be made immediately after arrival. So task situation or saturation means you have all these things you gotta get done and you gotta get done now, chop, 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 and the first whatever. So, you know, that's a, a place where mistakes can happen. Now, firefighters need to expect mistakes and be flexible to change the game plan. Unfortunately, mistakes get mistakes, and eventually one is significant enough to cause a serious problem, injury, or death. So again, that goes back to that whole Swiss cheese model. You know, you get a series of little mistakes, they all add up, and you got a big hole going through the block of cheese, and, you know, the accident happens. Although the C in crew resource management stands for crew, it might as well stand for communication. Lessons from the air industry have common phraseology such as over-communication, repetition, and concerns must be verbal and used during prolonged periods of low communication. Um, communication is the key here, folks. Briefings, talk through um, events ahead of time, challenge and respond, you know, give another viewpoint, work the problem, talk about it, um, of course, you know, an emergency situation, you know, communication in that aspect uh, may not be prudent. However, ensuring that you're all talking the same language and everyone understands what is going on and what needs to be done is. The last aspect to look at is problem solving. 
And this is based on three components, and this has to do with skills, rules, and knowledge. Now, the first way to solve a problem is considered skill-based. By learning skills the correct way, humans eventually become proficient in the process without thinking about each individual step. You may see a firefighter on the news put up a ladder by their self quickly and efficiently, but the process is actually a series of steps. By carrying the ladder butt first and slightly lowering, they reduce the chance of smacking someone in the head. Also, in a position to butt it against the base of the building to assist in raising it by their self. Then, of course, they're taught to look up before raising to identify hazards. Then walk up the ladder with their hands using the hand over hand method and make sure it's tied against the wall. So by grabbing one rung high, one rung low, they keep the tip held tight to the building while they lift and pull the butt end away and ensure proper climbing angles. So that's a great example of your skill based problem solving in terms of learning. Next, rule based. It is more advanced and is used often. Rule based procedures are in the format of an if-then statement. So going back to our ladder example, after placing the ladder at the proper climbing angle, look up and make sure that the ladder is vertical. If there are windows, chimneys, or other vertical lines on the building, then you can use those to ensure that it is not leaning to the left or right. If it is leaning, then attempt to straighten it by stomping one spur into the ground and recheck it. If the ladder is on hard pavement, then move the ladder to a more level location. If the ladder must be set on uneven ground, then consider blocking one side with cribbing or other suitable material. If you choose to block one beam, then make sure the ladder is sufficiently butted or tied off to prevent from slipping. So that's an excellent example of if it's this, then you do that. If it's this, then you do that. So rule-based. Skill again, taught. Finally, we have knowledge-based problem solving. And it is the most advanced type used. And this is taking every skill and rule we learn or we misuse equipment to complete a task. So assume you're an airport firefighter and have been dispatched to stand by for an incoming small aircraft with a landing gear problem. As the plane lands, the front gear buckles underneath and it skids off the end of the runway into a gully. There is no fire, but other units lay down a layer of foam as a precaution. While you and your partner are assigned to help evacuate the aircraft with ground ladders. Setting up ladders against the side of a round fuselage on even ground is a little tricky. You discover that the tip of the extinction ladder lays nicely on the bottom of the escape door, but the angle is much lower than a proper climbing angle and will be difficult to descend. Additionally, the position of the plane prevents you from putting the spur level on the ground, and it rocks with weight on it. Three feet back, there is a chain link fence, and you get an idea. You extend the ladder two clicks and jam the spur at the bottom link of the fence. The ladder is still at a bad angle, but is now stable. As an extra step for safety, your partner uses a carabiner to lock the truss of the beam to the fence. You decide that although it's a bad angle, the weight should not be an issue because the extension ladder is still collapsed and most of the way and having the passengers climb down the ladder however is another issue you consider using a stokes basket to ferry them up and down so essentially in this example 
we're using everything. We're using you know our skills and rules and our knowledge to come up with a plan that may or may not be you know exactly right. But we're doing it as safely as we can to minimize those risks. So in conclusion, empowerment must be addressed early in a firefighter's career. Teaching recruits how to identify and address unsafe acts responsibly is vital. A system that uses prevention and crew resource management has the best chance of using empowerment for the elimination of injuries. Unsafe practices can develop with years of experience. Training fires have become more safe thanks to, of course, NPA 1403. Empowerment is the granting of permission to exceed normal authority. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted. PPE is designed to prevent injuries. PPE must be used properly to be effective. Operational redundancy creates layers of protection which reduces the likelihood of injury. There are four categories of unsafe acts. Those are visible, invisible, poor decision making, and distracting events. The proactive approach to preventing unsafe acts utilizes education, engineering, environment, and enforcement. Unsafe acts can be stopped as they occur. Crew resource management is an effective form of empowerment. Situational awareness can be affected by task saturation. Communication relies on the interaction between emergency responders. Challenge and response technique is the proper way to address concerns. Problem solving can be skill-based, rule-based, or knowledge-based. Okay, gang, if you haven't done so already, make sure you read the chapter, of course, do the review questions, and if you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu, or you can call me in the office at 706-357-0162. Until next time, be safe and have a good shift.